We begin our journey here in Maputo, the capital city of Mozambique. We arrive at the end of September, springtime, when bright skies and steady breezes keep the climate perfectly pleasant in this seaside city. Mozambique is a narrow, long country bounded on the west by over 1,500 miles of sun-washed Indian Ocean coastline. The capital city is located just south of the Tropic of Capricorn near the country's southern tip. This port city is the economic heart of Mozambique. People arrive here from all parts of the country speaking any of 43 different languages, mostly of Bantu origin. But in Maputo, business is conducted in Portuguese, which became the official language of the region after it was colonized by Portugal 500 years ago. Though the southern coast of Mozambique is by far the most densely populated part of the country, the capital remains a slow-paced city of fewer than two million people. It's graced with quiet parks, serene vistas, and great restaurants serving mostly European cuisine and top-end Mozambican cuisine. That means seafood and unique dishes based upon a fusion of African, Portuguese, and New World foods. It's also a thriving hub for contemporary Mozambican art and music. Many of the city's broad avenues are named after heroes of African and communist revolutionary leaders, Ho Chi Minh, Kwame Nkrumah, Patrice Lumumba, Vladimir Lenin, and others, reflecting the political leanings of the country's first post-colonial government. But today, Mozambique has a free market, and one of the highest indices of economic inequality in the world. Some degrees of this inequality are visible in the capital, from the boutique shopping street to the mainstay markets to the slums on the margins of the city. Most remnants of the Portuguese colonial town date only from the mid-19th century. But the Portuguese presence here goes back 300 years earlier. The original Portuguese settlement was poor and wretched and served as a basic maritime outpost until it was completely destroyed in war with the local king. After that, in the late 18th century, the Portuguese built this fortress overlooking Maputo Bay. From here, the Portuguese defended their trading interests against the Dutch and British, and the modern town eventually grew around it. However, Maputo didn't become the capital of Portuguese East Africa until 1898. As one gets away from Maputo, the landscape opens up very quickly. Roadways are narrow, but smooth and newly built. North of Maputo, the tiny port city of Shaishai at the mouth of the Limpopo River is the largest town we see during our day-long, 300-mile journey along the coast. Much of this infrastructure, newly built and welcoming, is made possible today through Chinese financial capital. Hardly a hamlet, nor dwelling, nor tended field appears alongside the roadside for long stretches as we continue. But Mozambique is a huge country, nearly the same area as Germany and Spain combined, and home to a population of scarcely 26 million people. That's hardly more than the population of one of the world's megacities, like Delhi or Shanghai, spread throughout such a vast area. What should have been a six-hour journey to Tofo Beach takes nearly 10 hours due to many midway pickups and drop-offs for passengers and packages. But Tofo Beach is worth the drive. Eight unbroken miles of soft sand fronted by a handful of mid-range hotels and eateries. It's a perfect spot to relax in the fresh breezes and soak in the unspoiled natural beauty, or take long walks and discover the sand and sea that just keeps on going. As everywhere in Mozambique, much of the tourist infrastructure here is foreign-owned, mostly by South Africans, Portuguese, or other Europeans who know that small business opportunity beckons on this gorgeous coastline. This small tourist industry provides some jobs for local Mozambicans, but it can only provide so much. Here, as everywhere in Mozambique, unemployment and underemployment remain high due to lack of opportunity. Ordinary Mozambicans have little capital at their disposal, so growth of locally owned new businesses is limited. 
Our Mozambican friend said that what Mozambique needs most is training in technical and trade skills, as well as more general job skills. They need programs that can train plumbers, electricians, and other builders, programs that build computer literacy and software skills. A dearth of training for skilled work is holding back development, and they need investments in housing. Financial opportunities abound for those with the capital and know-how to invest in these growth areas. Nearby Tofo Beach is the charming little town of Inyambane, one of the oldest settlements along the Mozambican coastline, from where the Taos of the Indian Ocean trade had plied since at least the 11th century. In the 16th century, the Portuguese built a trading post here, and by 1560 they had also added a Jesuit mission, the first one in southeastern Africa. Over the following centuries, Inyambane became an important slave and ivory trading center. However, the original settlements were destroyed in battle with the local king, and what remains dates back to only the mid-19th century town built by the Portuguese colonists. Both the town's old mosque and old church date from this same period. Since colonial times, Mozambique is a mostly Christian country, though many of those Christians subscribed to both Christian and indigenous spiritual beliefs and freely mix their religious practices and they live in harmony with the 18% among them who continue to practice Islam, which arrived on these shores with the Indian Ocean trade hundreds of years before Vasco da Gama's men became the first European Christians to land here. Today the place has the quaint, sleepy air of an ex-colonial town that's been drained of noise, power, and opportunity. Its central areas remain well-planned and pretty, with a few nice eateries. The town's main market keeps bustling, serving the local communities of the region. Leaving Inyambane, we take a short ride across the Limpopo on a small dhow, propelled only by the wind. We emerge into the busy market area of Mashishi on the other side. Continuing northward by bus along the coastline, we don't pass through any more proper towns anywhere along the 150-mile route to Vilanculo. Though the roads are still solid and new, other modern infrastructures are nearly absent and the numbers of markedly poor people are increasing. Vilanculo is yet another one of Mozambique's many stunning beaches, but the main draw of this point is the Bazarutu Archipelago a smattering of tiny offshore desert islands that trace a dotted line parallel to the Mozambican coast. We head across the shallow straits to Magaruk Island. The Bazaruto Islands together are inhabited by fewer than 3,500 people. During the late colonial period, a small resort was built here on Magaruk, which during the 1950s and 60s became known as a refuge of the global rich and famous. That resort is currently being rebuilt. The island soon reveals itself to be but a giant sandbar, anchored by a reef on the mainland side and held down by the hardy deep roots of native plants. What makes these islands so spectacular is their pristine emptiness. Here, the beach, sea, and sky expand to fill the whole of the world, expressed in the multi-hued palette of sand, water, and air, accented by crabs, native flora, and birds. Again we head northward, this time by air followed by a long chapa ride from the hard scrapple town of Nampula, stopping frequently to pay off predatory cops. We skip over the central region of the country where old factions from the days of the Mozambican Civil War had recently tried again to flex their muscle, though thankfully without real consequence. The Mozambican Civil War was sparked in 1977 for very complex reasons. To simplify, some Mozambicans were opposed to the newly independent nation's tryst with communism. Others were unhappy with sweeping social reforms, like ending the practices of bride price and traditional medicine. Yet other Mozambicans, who had fought alongside the government factions in the War of Independence until but a few years earlier, were dissatisfied with how power got carved up after they had won. 
fighters from these factions all joined hands with the military unit founded by the white government of Rhodesia and funded by the apartheid regime of South Africa, both of whom were interested in destabilizing the only black-run government in their region in order to provoke its failure. The United States also funded this rebel militia because the USSR was funding the newly elected communist government on the other side. This unlikely African traditionalist white supremacist Cold War battleground raged very hot for more than 15 years, during which time villages were sacked and plundered, children were stolen and conscripted, landmines were planted, and hungry soldiers slaughtered unprecedented numbers of wild game, decimating the local animal populations which have never recovered. And through all of this, most ordinary Mozambicans, without access to literacy, electricity, news or information, were trapped in the midst of the violence with no real idea what the fighting was all about. Everybody was relieved when war at last exhausted itself, giving way to a ceasefire in 1992. By that time, Mozambique was the poorest, most devastated country on earth. It's from that nadir that they have been rebuilding for more than two decades, and today, Mozambicans are palpably optimistic toward their future. At last we arrive at Mozambique Island, from which the modern nation takes its name, and the northernmost point of our tour. Mozambique Island is another tiny offshore islet. You can walk around the whole of it in a few hours. In modern times, it's been joined to the mainland by a narrow causeway. But for hundreds of years, this sandy, rocky speck was a lively center of trade and shipbuilding, one of the many Swahili ports of the flourishing and far-reaching Indian Ocean trade network. But Vasco da Gama landed here in 1498, and he was impressed by what he saw. Shortly thereafter, the reigning Sultan, Musi Alimbiki, found his island under bombardment by the Portuguese, whose goal was to control the existing trade networks. By 1507, the Portuguese had taken over and declared this island the capital of their colony, Portuguese East Africa. They named the island Mozambique after the defeated Sultan. From here began the colonial seizure of lands further inland and further south. Local populations were forced into laboring for their uninvited landlords in a kind of serfdom. Nothing of the pre-colonial town remains to be seen here, but most colonial buildings survive in place, if crumbling. Mozambique Island has many similarities to other Portuguese colonial establishments of the Indian Ocean world. Broad roads flanked by bulky square buildings with small windows, clearly designed by people from a colder climate. Parks and gardens draped with banyan trees brought from India. A brawny maritime fortress. The fortress still commands the northern tip of the island, from where the Portuguese battled the Dutch and the British. In this fortress, they built their first chapel, which is considered to be the oldest European-built structure still standing in sub-Saharan Africa. Here you will also find the first hospital built in sub-Saharan Africa, now a defunct relic. Near the old customs house stands the old governor's mansion, which has been renovated as a small museum. It remained in use by the governor of Portuguese East Africa until at least 1898, when the colonial capital was moved south to the city now called Maputo. The town's fortunes declined rapidly after that. Today, about 14,000 people make this island their home. Most of the islanders fish for a living. A few are engaged in the nascent tourist trade that's developing here. The busy Wednesday market offers small goods and second-hand clothes.
Life is slow here and peaceful, if challenging to make a living. Kids are in school and playing sports tournaments in the lovely parks they inherited from the colonists. In another series of overstuffed Shapa rides, we make our way now westward across the country. The landscape changes as we move toward the great rifts of eastern Africa, massive inselbergs thrust upward from the undulating earth. About halfway across the country, the pavement gives way to broken road. Electric lines fall away, cultivated fields disappear. Mozambique won independence from Portugal only in 1975, following a decade of sporadic warfare. Thus ended more than 450 years of colonial rule. At this time, nearly all of those who identified as ethnically Portuguese vacated the country, spitefully raising farms, killing livestock, and demolishing machinery as they left. Two years later, the country was engulfed in civil war. But for the past two and a half decades, Mozambique has been finding its way forward, figuring out how to remake itself as a modern nation state, cobbled together from dozens of different ethnicities and languages. There is a great deal to rebuild from the ashes of colonialism. And today, resources and populations are highly unevenly distributed, posing challenges of logistics and delivery. But in the face of all of that, Mozambicans continue forward, hopeful about their own future as a nation, hopeful about the opportunity to engage with the world. If you can get here to see it with your own eyes, there's plenty of scenic beauty, friendly people, and everyday kindness to reward your journey. <laughs> I'm big.